I want to play you a clip of Donald Trump. This was an interesting one. He, of course, he was the Donald, uh, was thinking about running for president. And I called his office in New York. And, you know, I'm from New York, so I had somewhat of an aggressive streak at times. And uh, if I start talking fast, I sound like I'm a little bit from New York. Um, and I called his assistant, Michael Cohen, and I said, I would like to speak with Donald Trump. He's thinking about running for president. And Michael Cohen, in his typical New York accent, says, hey, why should Mr. Trump talk with you? Just like that. And, I, and then at that point, now you can do it two ways. At that point, you can be, well, well, I would really like to talk to him. No, that doesn't work uh, with people like, uh, that are around Donald Trump. So I said, the reason, and then I started talking like this. You know, the reason he needs to talk to us is because evangelicals are, you know, I'm talking like this, evangelicals are important. You know, evangelicals are really important. He needs to sit down with me so our 700 club audience can really check him out like that. So, you know, and then he's like, all right, fine. I'll schedule something. We'll, we'll see. We'll see. Anyhow, the bottom line is uh, I did get to interview him up in Trump Tower. I did not get fired, uh, by the way. Uh, and here is a clip, oh, before, let me set this clip up. I ask him, he, by the way, he walks into the room with a picture. Uh, and the picture is him being confirmed as a child at 14 years old uh, in the Presbyterian church. He goes, I need to show this to someone. Let me show this to someone. <laughs> So, you know, that's, that was my first experience with Donald Trump. And then I asked him about, does he, uh, about his church attendance and all of this. And then he talks about how people send him Bibles. It, it's wild stuff. H have a look. Do you actively go to church or is that something that is more just when, when you can? Right. Well, I go as much as I can always on Christmas, always on Easter, mm -hmm. uh, always when there's a major occasion. And during the, during the Sundays, I'm a Sunday church person, I'll go when I can. Mm -hmm. The Bibles. I understand a lot of people send you Bibles. Is that true? Well, I get sent Bibles by a lot of people. Where are all those Bibles anyhow now? <laughs> well, actually, we, we keep them in a certain place, a very, very nice place. But people send me Bibles. And, you know, it's very interesting. I get so much mail. And because, like, you know, I'm in this incredible location in Manhattan, you can't keep most of the mail you get. There's no way I would ever do anything to do negative to a Bible. So what we do is we keep all of the Bibles. We just... I would have a fear of, of doing something other than very positive. So actually I store them and keep them and sometimes give them away to other people. But I do get sent a lot of Bibles. Very interesting. And I like that. I think that's great. I know you're... <laughs> oh, I don't know what to say. Uh, it was great. I favorite God stories. I love this story. So I'm sitting at my desk one day and I'm eating this, you know, my salad. And all of a sudden, I get a call from the exec, uh, and, you know, the big television Sunday show. Oh my goodness. And I'm like, you've got to be kidding me. Meet the press is calling me and they say they want to have me on the show. And I say, well, actually, I thought to myself first, I looked for table edges because when I fainted, I didn't want to hit one <laughs> because if I die, I can't make the appearance. <laughs> so that's a problem. Uh, but after I pulled it together, uh, I said, sure, no problem. I mean, wh what was I going to say, no? Um, but I believe the world supply of tongues decreased that week. I was so nervous. I was so nervous. You know, um, it it's interesting. My prayer life took off during that week. And I would pray every night, and I wrote it down because I remember it succinctly, so I'm going to write it down. I said, Lord Jesus, please give me the right words to say and take these, take these nerves away. I need your peace now more than ever. Well, I continue to be nervous all six days. It continued every single day. Um, I'm getting to the end of that story you know, here in a moment because I like to eat. Um, and there's one sh thing you should know about me. That's not my t-shirt, by the way, but I want people to feed me at all times. And the day of the show, the morning of the show, I was, my stomach, you can imagine. I mean, I was not in a good state. So they send a limo uh, to come, or a sedan, driving me to the torture chamber. Um, and then all of a sudden, God showed up in the car. Now, not God actually God, I mean, for example, like Morgan Freeman, <laughs> Bruce Almighty, did, did, did not show up. But God definitely made his presence felt, because it turned out the driver of that car, of that sedan, 
was a pastor from a startup church. And he didn't know any, I didn't say one word to him when I got in the car about how nervous I was and I didn't ask for Tums or anything. And it was amazing because he told me that he just started preaching. He just started preaching, he talked about how God will give you rest, will give you peace. It was the perfect message at the perfect time. It was really amazing. So now I'd like to say that this was the best evangelical story in the world, that I got out of the, the, the sedan there and I had no nerves, or I had, I had no more nervous feelings. But that wasn't true. I was still nervous. I was still nervous. I walked into the green room. Oh, that's the blue room. Uh, there's the green room. I met uh, Tim Russert. And there's a fruit and bagels and locks in the green room. And look, I couldn't even eat the bagels and locks and that for a Jewish guy. <laughs> I mean, you knew how bad it was. So now I'm in the studio, and the guy yells, one minute to air. I'm nervous. I am nervous. I think, you know, I'm, I, I don't know what to do. All of a sudden, the red light went off. And then all of a sudden, there were no nerves. No nerves whatsoever. It was amazing. Literally, God's timing was perfect. It happened right at that moment. Social media, uh, the blogs, uh, conservative talk radio, um, Fox News to a degree. I mean, the landscape is changing. It's changing right before our eyes, and it's not coming back. Uh, the Washington Post, the New York Times, all of those publications are, if you notice their coverage, they're starting to follow, they're starting to do stories based on many blog reports, uh, based on some of what conservative talk radio has to offer. The paradigm is shifting. Uh, it's slow. <laughs> it's very slow. But there is hope. There, there's definite hope. But the problem is, and what I've noticed, is that there is an echo chamber out there. All of these guys, I work on M Street, just a, two blocks from K Street in Washington, D.C. And I can tell you that all of these mainstream media guys, um, it, it's very much an echo chamber because they all run in the same circles. And so that's why Meet the Press, uh, really, and, and other shows like it, dictate what, what, they're, what they're talking about and what they're hearing. You know, the, a lot of people say the media is liberal. Well, sure, they're, they're liberal. But that's not so much what drives them. It's the worldview that they have. It's the fact that they're always talking to each other, that it's what they know. Honestly, it's, it's somewhat intellectually lazy on their part to understand the heartland and to understand what's out there. And so that, that's a big part of, uh, of the paradigm that needs to shift. The good news here, and here's the good news, is that what I've been telling newsmakers across the country is, look, it's time that the paradigm changes for good. In other words, why let the Washington Post and the New York Times and all these other publications start to drive the coverage like they have for years? It's time that CBN and some other Christian organizations start to drive the news. And that when I say drive the news, not necessarily with an agenda, but just simply report on things that haven't been reported by the mainstream media. And hopefully newsmakers will listen and they'll give us the access that they give the, they give, uh, the New York Times now. If I can just say one more thing, and I'll, not to call out any names, but there have been many newsmakers, conservative newsmakers, who complain about the mainstream media and then leak something to the mainstream media to get press. That's a real problem. If, if, you, if, if you're going to complain about the mainstream media and then wink, wink, here's a little tip for you and give that to the New York Times, why are you doing that? And then there's Herman Cain. Um, Obviously, uh, Rule 101 in politics, uh, any scandal, real or perceived, is going to doom you. Uh, two or three scandals will really doom you, and he was out of the race. One of the other problems with Herman Cain, and I want to show you a clip real quick, is when he started talking about foreign policy. You know, one of the things that is important, you must have a strong command, if you're going to run for president of the United States, of foreign policy. Herman Cain didn't seem like he had that. And I asked him a question, you're about to see it. This was right when he was taking off and, and all of the headlines were great and he had just won a big Florida straw poll. And I asked him, I said, are you ready for the gotcha questions? And when he answered, listen to what he says about the country of Ubekistan. Have a look. 
Are you ready for the gotcha questions? They're coming from the media and others on foreign policy. Who's the president of Uzbekistan? All, you know, all of this stuff. It's, it's coming. Yes. And how are you dealing with that? I'm ready for the gotcha questions. And they are already starting to come. And when they ask me who's the president of you, Becky, 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 Stan, Stan, I'm going to say, you know, I don't know. Do you know? And then I'm going to say, how's that going to create one job? I want to focus on the top priorities of this country. That's what leaders do. They make sure that the nation is focused on the critical issues with critical solutions. Knowing who is the head of some of these small, insignificant states around the world, I don't think that is something that's critical to focusing on national security and getting this economy going. Mm -hmm. When I get ready to go visit that country, I'll know who it is. But until then, I want to focus on the big issues that we Both need. Both of them in Afghanistan. Karzai went up to Clinton and said, I hear one of your presidential candidates called you, Ubekistan, you Becky, 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 Stan, Stan. Well, that was the interview. The point is, for all you journalism students out there, be careful because th all of this stuff, you never know who's going to hear about it, like Hamid Karzai. You never know. Let me start out with a definition of what we're talking about here. Uh, a evangelical is an evangelical Christian or a conservative Christian, don't have to be evangelical, could be Catholic, and go down the list, who agrees with the Tea Party agenda or is actually a Tea Party member. So if you fit any of those categories, I'd like to call you a Tea evangelical. I don't like labels. I, I grew up Jewish. Uh, I gave my life to Christ in 1988. Uh, so believe me, I've been called a lot of different things. Uh, and so I don't like labels at all. But I think the Tea evangelical label is a pretty good mix uh, of what exactly has been going on in this country. Uh, for sure, what we saw in 2010 and now what we're seeing in 2012. Uh, we saw that in 2010, obviously, with the flip of the House. And I can go on and on with all the victories that we saw where the Tea Party stood up. And evangelicals were a huge part of the Tea Party. I mean, you, you look at the statistics, and this is very conservative, conservatively speaking. You can make the argument that at least half, if not a lot more, of the Tea Party is conservative Christian, evangelical. Probably close to 60 to 70 percent, quite frankly, but we'll give it at about 51, 52 percent. The point is, is that without evangelicals in the Tea Party movement, there probably wouldn't be too much of a Tea Party movement. Now, that is not to discount the libertarians in the Tea Party movement at all, because quite frankly, just like the libertarians can't do it all by themselves within the Tea Party, neither can evangelical Christians. They need to come together. So what we're seeing is libertarians, conservative Christians coming together in one purpose, in one sole purpose, uh, to basically affect change in America. The, the, the question is why exactly? Why are evangelicals signing up uh, for the Tea Party? Well, if, if any of you are obviously involved in the Tea Party, you probably know exactly why. And we'll, we'll discuss some of that today. I want to introduce our panels, we, uh, our panel members. We will get to some questions a little later, so if you have any questions, just let us know. Um, I should uh, shamelessly ad admit, uh, and narcissistically as well, that I have a book, what a shock, uh, called The Tea Evangelicals. Uh, and uh, oh, look at that, uh, the, the, the prop man, Miles Terry, uh, and I appreciate that. You should come on the road with me, actually.